beginning of 2022, hosted by uh, the SOAS Middle East Institute and co-hosted by the Center for Palestine Studies and the Center for Iranian Studies. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Marina Rasto from Princeton University, and she's going to talk about her book, The Lost Archive, um, which is an archive of the Fatimid uh, Caliphate, 909 to 1171, how it survived in an unexpected place, the storage room, uh, or the Geniza, I don't know whether I'm pronouncing it properly, uh, of a synagogue in Cairo, recycled as scrap paper and deposited there by medieval Jews. She tells the story of this extraordinary find, inviting us to reconsider the long-standing but the mistaken consensus that before 1500, uh, the dynasties of the Islamic Middle East produced few documents and preserved even fewer. Uh, I don't want to take too much of your time, but uh, I want to um, introduce uh, Marina. Marina is the Peduri Zilka Professor of Jewish Civilization in the Near East and Professor of Near Eastern Studies and History at Princeton University. She is Director of the Princeton uh, Geniza Lab and a MacArthur Fellow and is the author of Heresy and the Politics of Community, the Jews of uh, the, uh, the Fatimid uh, Caliphate. Uh, without further ado, I invite um, uh, Marina to begin her talk. She is going to share a PowerPoint uh, with us. And um, as normal, please post your questions in the chat uh, icon um, at the bottom of the Zoom page. Um, and uh, I will collect the questions and pose them to Marina um, at the end of uh, the discussion. But I also want uh, to welcome Nargis Farzad, who is the chair of the Center for uh, Iranian Study, who is my partner in crime, and um, really looking forward to uh, the discussion. Marina, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dina, and thank you, Nargis, and thanks to everyone who made this possible. It's uh, it's really a, um, an honor to, to be here uh, among you. Um, the very first foray I did into the subject um, of this book, before I knew I was even writing this book, um, was an article published in the Bulletin of the SOAS in, uh, in 2010. So it's, uh, this, this feels full circle to me. So thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna start with the cover um, of the book. I just wanna point out a few things about it um, and why I chose this as the color illustration. Um, so this uh, comes from um, a larger illustration that actually has two angels, not just the one that appears on the cover of the book. Um, and this is what the page looks like in its original context. Um, it's an illustration from a 13th century Iraqi manuscript, even though um, the book is neither about the 13th century nor really about Iraq, although as you'll see, I do get into Iraq a little bit. Um, it's mainly about Egypt in the 10th, 11th and 12th centuries. Um, but the illustration was too tempting um, because in addition to the fantastic robes and uh, the golden tiraz bands that you can see on the shoulders um, of these uh, of these fantastic robes, um, each of these angels is depicted holding a long uh, scroll. Um, a rotulus is the technical term that uh, manuscript scholars use for, for a, long, um, a long roll, a vertical scroll, um, written uh, with very, very wide line spacing in Arabic script. And anyone in uh, the medieval Islamic world would immediately recognize uh, such a rotulus as being a government decree because this by the 13th century was how government decrees had come to look very, very profligately spaced um, rotally that were quite quite performative and, and, uh, and grand um, to look at. Um, the uh, uh, context, I just wanna give you a sense of the historical context before I kind of get into the nitty gritty, um, is this uh, interesting moment um, in the history of the, the Middle East, when uh, the Abbasid Caliphate, which had ruled over um, most of the Islamic world for a couple of centuries, began to fragment into smaller um, caliphates, smaller polities that then declared themselves caliphates also, which was really an affront to the political theory of the caliphate. There was only supposed to be one caliph at a time. Um, the uh, the vicegerent of God on earth. And uh, um, 
and by the middle of the 10th century, in fact, there are three caliphs. There's one in Spain, the Umayyad uh, caliphs. They declare themselves caliphs in 929. Um, and the Fatimids, who um, arose in central North Africa and declared their caliphate in 909. So this map shows Fatimid ter territory um, in the early uh, 10th century. And if you keep your eyes on the map, you can see what happens over the course of the 10th century. Fatimid territory goes from being um, this little bit of Northern Africa to being quite extensive and really covering the whole of the Southern and Eastern Mediterranean. So if you were a 10th century Mediterranean person, the Fatimids would be like the central power that you're aware of and that you have to contend with um, in uh, in whatever you do. And meanwhile, the Abbasids were restricted um, to what to them must have seemed like a very, very small, um, small area uh, compared to what they'd ruled before. The Fatimids uh, entered Egypt in 969. So that's kind of the key date for Egypt. It was a, a bloodless conquest. In fact, Egypt had been um, in a political vacuum for a while. The Abbasids actually found it difficult to govern territories so far afield. Um, but Egypt was a very big prize for the Fatimids because it was a um, very lucrative tax generating um, region. And so once the Fatimids had secured Egypt, um, that was kind of, you know, that solidified their empire and they continued um, to rule uh, through 1171, although they lost crucial parts of Syria because of the Crusades. Um, but they were in Egypt until 1171 and that's when the regime fell. Uh, and um, the regime that succeeded them are the Ayyubids, most famous for Saladin, um, who's the one who gets Jerusalem back from the Crusaders in 1187. The um, people who lived uh, through this would have been quite aware of what was happening. So there was a geographer um, who was from Jerusalem who lived in the late 10th century, um, who in his survey, of uh, all the countries of the world that he knew of, um, says uh, about Egypt and Cairo in particular, Baghdad has been superseded until the day of judgment. Egypt's metropole has now become the greatest glory of the Muslims. So people in the 10th century would have been even aware that the center um, cultural, political, economic had shifted um, from Baghdad to Cairo. The city of Cairo was in fact founded um, by the Fatimids. So as soon as the Fatimids enter Egypt in 969, they uh, set about building um, a palace. So Cairo was initially just a Palatine complex. It wasn't actually a place where like normal people lived. The place where normal people lived was to the south here, Fusat, which was an older city founded on a Roman fortress of which you can still see some of the remains here in black. Um, if you visit uh, Cairo today, and you can actually visit the, um, the, the segment of the city that used to be known as Fustat. Um, you should ask for Coptic Cairo or Masil Qadima. And um, the yellow buildings that you see here are churches that still exist. Um, the green ones are mosques. And in the blue here, you have the Ben Ezra Synagogue. The Ben Ezra Synagogue was built in the 11th century. And um, it uh, preserved an enormous number of manuscripts in a kind of secret chamber. Um, so many manuscripts, in fact, that uh, I mean, less than half, I think, have been have been cataloged um, or identified in any way at this point. Um, this is a view from the interior of the Ben Ezra synagogue. Um, you're in the mezzanine looking towards the front wall of the synagogue. And if your eye follows along the left hand side of the mezzanine toward the front wall, you'll see that there's a tiny opening here. So this isn't the original synagogue. It was completely rebuilt um, in the late 19th century, which has to do with the fact that these manuscripts were discovered. They wouldn't have been discovered had the synagogue not been completely um, torn down and then rebuilt. Um, but it was in a, in a kind of walled in chamber, much like this one, that the Geniza manuscripts were found. Um, they were in absolutely no order whatsoever. You cannot even do stratigraphy on Geniza finds, unfortunately. So it really is just a jumble of texts. Um, ranging in date from about 900. There are some like early, early outliers that are that early. Um, mostly things pick up in about 1000 um, up until 1897, which is when the synagogue chamber was finally um, emptied. Um, the, the name Geniza comes from Beit Geniza, which is a, a kind of traditional um, storage chamber 
um, for Warren texts in Hebrew script. But what's so interesting as we kind of go deeper and deeper into the material that was found there is that um, probably the in Hebrew script part needs to be taken out of the definition. I mean, that's kind of like what we tell our students, but is it really true? I think that uh, that can be that can be questioned. Um, and just to give you a kind of very, very brief overview of, of the bigger picture of what's in the Geniza before I get to the little piece of it that generated my book. Um, the vast majority of what's been found in the Geniza dates um, to uh, between 950 and 1250, although there are significant pockets from the 16th and 19th centuries. And this has to do with the urban demography of, of Cairo um, and kind of the neighborhoods that, that Jews inhabited in one period um, or another. The grand total is about 400,000 pages of text or fragments of pages. And most of the pages found in the Geniza are single pages, even if they come from larger works. Um, so things were very kind of tattered. And uh, if you had a whole book, you probably wouldn't put it in the Geniza. You would repair it um, or, uh, or, or try and keep it intact in some way. Um, but it was when things really became too worn to be useful that they entered the Geniza chamber. Um, so about 90% of what um, was found in the Geniza, again, an estimate because we don't exactly know what, what all is in there. Um, about 90% of it uh, are books. And I put books in quotation marks because books in the Middle Ages could be many different formats. Um, the codex, which is like the book as we know it, what you bring to the beach with you, um, that's a, a codex for medievalists, but not all books in the Middle Ages were codices. Um, that leaves about 10% um, of the material that uh, is uh, documentary. So documentary texts being letters, um, legal deeds, lists, accounts, ephemera of every possible type. And that is what I've always worked on. I mean, since, uh, since I got into this, uh, this business. However, I was trained to work on the documentary texts in Hebrew script. And for this project, I made a kind of um, turn towards the uh, documentary texts in Arabic script, and there were many, many more than I expected at the beginning. So here I'm just showing you a kind of typical example of a document in Hebrew script. This is a marriage contract. Um, it's in the Hebrew script and the Hebrew language, whereas a lot of texts that you find in Hebrew script are in Aramaic or in Judeo-Arabic, which is Arabic in Hebrew characters. Um, and in fact, here is an example of a Judeo-Arabic text. This is a, a letter. Um, it's a personal letter, personal slash business. They're, they're often mixed um, from a trader who is, uh, at the time of writing, traveling um, down the Red Sea uh, towards the Indian Ocean where he's going to be trading. There was a burgeoning Indian Ocean trade in the 12th and 13th century that's documented in trade letters from the Geniza. So um, that is, uh, is what we kind of know of the Cairo Geniza in general. It covers this enormous swath of, um, of the globe. You have uh, um, Jews who are trading all across the Indian Ocean and then um, certainly material from all over the Mediterranean. So it's really quite a remarkable um, remarkable cache of texts. Um, the discovery stories are quite interesting. Um, a book from 10 years ago, Sacred Trash, tells the story of how um, the Geniza was ultimately, how it came to the attention of scholars. Um, and a book that is coming out next month by Rebecca Jefferson, The Cairo Geniza in the Age of, and the Age of Discovery in Egypt, um, calls into question some aspects of the story that's told in the first book, um, but both are absolutely fantastic um, attempts to reconstruct um, how all this came about and, and what uh, led to the Guinea's discovery and where did all the manuscripts go, questions like that that can be very difficult to nail down. Um, so, so far we have two books on that. Um, part of the reason that tracking the Guinea is so difficult is that ultimately the texts were dispersed across uh, more than 60 libraries and private collections. Um, the vast majority is at the Cambridge University Library um, and there are significant collections in New York, St. Petersburg, um, Oxford, Manchester, and London, um, in addition to a smattering of other places. Um, which means that you can be looking at a single text that can be divided by an ocean. So um, when you find two puzzle pieces like this, it's called a join. Um, that's what people who work on papyri call it, and that's what people who work in my field call it as well. Um, so this is a join uh, between manuscripts in New York and Oxford. 
um, digital imaging has made it much, much more, more, uh, uh, much easier to find these joined because you can be in two libraries at the same time, as it were. Um, you don't have to rely on your visual uh, memory um, or difficult access to photographs. Here's another example of a join. These are two pieces that are in Cambridge. Um, and uh, there, this is a 15th century court record um, from Cairo. And uh, what's so you know, frustrating when I tell my students um, is that if you find a join and they're both in Cambridge, it doesn't mean that they're gonna be um, recataloged and housed together. On the contrary, these will always bear these two totally different class marks. And then in the literature, they're referred to with a plus sign in between the two class marks. So the record of the join is always um, is, is there uh, to see for posterity. Um, okay, so that leads me um, into the heart of the matter. Um, this is a very, very impressive join, um, which I myself did not find. This was found by uh, Ronnie Shweka, and it's impressive because it's in many, many pieces. Um, from my point of view, this is an incredibly precious text because this is about a meter, 23 centimeters of a Fatimid decree. And Fatima decrees um, until this came along and fell into my lap um, were, uh, there were there were 10 of them that were known in the world, eight of which had been preserved at the Monastery of St. Catherine in Sinai um, and two of which were in Cairo. Um, and they had been published in the 1960s. And as far as anybody knew, that was, that was it. But it turns out that there were lots and lots of fragments of Fatima decrees in the Geniza. And so the reason I undertook the Lost Archive was to try to explain or understand why. One of the reasons that I could never have found this join myself is that you can see immediately you have Arabic script with very wide line spacing, right? So even if I hadn't told you that this was a decree, just looking at the cover of my book and what I told you about it, you'd know that this was a decree. Um, but the very wide line spacing makes it virtually impossible to put the puzzle pieces together because you don't have um, the text kind of telling you what goes with what. And often uh, with these joins, they're not perfect puzzle pieces because fragments decay from the edges inward. Um, so the reason that my colleague Ronnie Schweka was able to find this is that he was looking for a completely different text. He was looking for the Hebrew and Aramaic text uh, on the other side. And um, he uh, found 120 examples of this, this text in the Geniza and he realized that these belong together in a single manuscript. Um, he then emailed me, I think we were in Oxford at the time, and he emails me from across the Oriental Institute library and says, hey, I have found something that you might be interested in. Um, and not only was I interested, I actually told him who the scribe was on this side, on, on the, the verso, the side that he was interested in, um, a man named Ephraim ben Shemaria, who was the head of the congregation that prayed in the Ben Ezra synagogue where all of this um, was found. Um, and this is like, you know, people who work on literary texts in the Geniza, as Ronnie Shweka does, versus people like me who work on documentary texts, we don't talk enough. And this was an example of that, where one of my documentary guys happened to be the scribe of one of his literary manuscripts. So he said, look at the other side. And I did. And I said, my gosh, like I have found lots of fragments of Fatima decrees, but I've never been able to actually piece one together um, at quite this length before. So that was um, pretty much all the inducement I needed to try and follow through um, on, this, on this topic. Um, one of the reasons it's so unusual and so exciting to find um, Fatima decree fragments um, in, the, in anywhere um, is that um, most of what we know about the Fatimids is based on long form sources, what historians would call literary sources. So not necessarily literature proper, they can also be chronicles or legal codes, um, anything written um, in long form as opposed to a documentary text, anything intended for posterity, um, a, uh, a historian would call a literary text. So this is one of the major sources that had been uh, relied upon for Fatimid history um, by a wonderful 15th century historian called the Makrizi, who himself was from Cairo and spent his whole life in Cairo and was really just like Kyrene to his soul um, and was so interested in Cairo that he wanted to know the history of the city, including its founders, its founders being the Fatimids. So he wrote two books that have very, very significant information um, for the Fatimid period. Um, long form texts are very nice to work with because they have a narrative and they have a point of view, which is not necessarily a weakness, provided that you don't take their point of view at face value. 
Um, they're also useful because El Makrizi, for instance, had access to earlier chronicles, earlier manuscripts that we no longer have. So often you can find information um, in these guys that's much, much older. Um, so there are some 11th and 12th century eyewitness um, chronicles that are preserved in El Makrizi's later chronicle of the Fatimids. But there are also things that chronicles can't give you. Um, they can't give you the materiality of uh, archival sources. Um, the materiality itself contains information that can be important. Um, the chronicles don't give you the messiness of a ground level view. Um, or as a historian, they don't always give you the thrill of reconstructing history from fragments. Um, chroniclers have a kind of déformation professionnelle, which is that they persuade you that they're telling the whole story. Um, not persuading you necessarily in so many words or explicitly, but the fact of having a coherent narrative is itself a kind of filter, um, as any practicing historian will tell you. Um, so archival documents can can give you some of what chronicles can't. Um, but archives, on the other hand, are a more elusive thing than one might think. Um, the Geniza was not an archive. Um, archives are intended not just for storage, but also for retrieval. Archives are organized spaces. Um, there should be some sense of order, otherwise the, the retrieval part of their mission simply can't work. Um, whereas for the Geniza, they were never intended um, for retrieval. Um, but archives aren't always ready-made. Sometimes you have to piece together your, your own archive from fragments. So if an archive hasn't survived in continuity down to the present, but lies buried in some ruin or some secret chamber, then chances are it's going to be quite um, disorganized. Um, and yet the fact remains that for the period before about 1100, the Middle East preserved more original documents than Europe, um, probably by an order of magnitude. So let me just explain what I mean by that. Um, in, in Europe, uh, most of the original documents that we have date from after 1100 um, for a very simple reason, which is there was a kind of bottleneck um, where many of the older documents were recopied into cartularies. Um, a cartulary being usually a codex shaped um, a book that um, preserves summaries of earlier documents. So a cartulary too will not give you the original kind of uh, uh, texture or material flavor um, of a document. Whereas um, from the Middle East, you have papyri um, from Egypt that date to, uh, you know, just a decade after, um, or maybe a few years after the uh, Islamic conquest of Egypt in 640. Um, however, the documentation is very, very Egypt centric, very Egypt heavy. Um, so that's that's one thing that all documentary historians of the Middle East have to have to contend with. Um, okay, so as for Fatimid um, documents uh, in the Cairo Geniza, there were many, many more of them than I anticipated. Um, this is. Uh, <laughs> This was kind of a funny, a funny story for me because when I first started to work on this, I published a small um, kind of notice, a little article in the um, uh, newsletter of the Cambridge University Library Geniza Research Unit, um, saying kind of what these were and the fact that I was working on them. And I started to get emails from people um, who had seen these um, widely spaced lines of Arabic in text that they had worked on and not known what they were. So this was the very first email I got from um, a fantastic scholar called Shama Friedman, who works on uh, manuscripts of the Babylonian Talmud, um, one of the major works of, uh, of Judaism from, the, from late antiquity. Um, and uh, he wrote to me and he said, now I understand why this manuscript that I published in the 1980s has these giant lines of Arabic going across it, because in fact, what it preserves is the end of um, what I believe to be a late fop in the decree, but here I'm going based on paleography, um, because there's no date on the fragment itself. Um, that, that scribe, um, this one, sorry, this scribe has reused the text by um, chopping it into pieces or perhaps buying it already chopped up. Um, and then uh, turning it 90 degrees and folding it in half to form a bifolio. Um, there may be others just like it that were the other bifolios that belong in a single choir, but those have not yet come to light. 
Um, but there are many other ways of treating um, these uh, fragmentary Fatima decrees. So here's one that's cut in half down the middle. Um, the scribe used it only on the other side, which I'm not showing you. Um, here's one where the scribe uh, wrote on the other side and didn't have enough room on the other side. So he started to write between the lines, quite literally between the lines, but perpendicular. Um, here's one where you'll find the verso totally covered, but also again, between the lines, the scribe has taken some notes on the calendar as it turns out. Um, here, the scribe has folded the page in quadrants um, and written a uh, long encomium um, to a Fatimid general um, an encomium in Hebrew, not actually atypical from the kinds of things that you find in the Geniza. Um, and here we have a page from um, a choir, uh, part of which was composed of recycled um, Fatima decrees. Some of these are quite large, some of them are a bit smaller. There's no kind of one standard size, but there are probably two more or less standard sizes um, that I was able to find, 43 centimeters across and then 20 to 25 centimeters in width. The lengths, they could be enormously long. The longest Fatima decree, um, extant Fatima decree I'm aware of um, is more than eight meters long. I have not been able to reconstruct anything of that length um, from guineas of fragments, but there, uh, there's plenty of quantity. Um, here uh, are three different Fatima chancery decrees that were reused by a single Jewish trader. And the significance of these fragments um, is that they were the first time I had actually been able to date both the original Fatima decree and also their reuse. So this gave me a clue to how long did it take for these things to get recycled, which then was in turn a clue to how did they get recycled. So um, the, the Fatima decree has to date to after 1131 because a caliph is mentioned who, um, who ascends to the caliphate in 1131, al-Hafid. And uh, the Jewish trader who reuses them actually mentions the date when he's writing his letters, and that is um, 1139 and 1140. So we know that there's less than a decade um, between the reuse of at least some of these decrees um, uh, between when they were originally issued and their reuse. Um, and I'll get back to that, that question of the life cycle in, in just a minute. Um, but first, I want to point out that it wasn't just Jews who reused um, Fatima decrees. Um, this is a Christian reuse, so it's a, a text in Greek. Um, this is found by my colleague Naim Fentihem, um, and definitely a Fatima decree originally on the recto. Um, this is a, a Fatima um, probably treaty with one of the Italian city-states, um, probably Genova, um, reused by a notary for um, a number of copies of uh, legal texts um, in Latin. Um, and so you can see the large lines which he's crossed out um, are in both Arabic and in Latin as well. And this is from more or less the same period, 1150s, 1160s. Part of the reason that nobody had worked on these before is simply that nobody knew what they were. Um, so if you look in the 1906 otherwise fantastic catalog um, of the Bodleian Geniza collection, um, every time you find one of these documents, it's cataloged the same way, which is scribbling. And in fact, scribbling is what people um, thought they were and what I certainly would have thought they were. Had um, Jeffrey Kahn, uh, who's a uh, Regis Professor of Hebrew at Cambridge, had he not come along and worked on texts like this one, like the ones that I worked on, um, uh, back in the 1980s and 1990s. And without his work, I would certainly not have been able to do mine. Um, it's a practice also that goes beyond the Fatimids. So this is a 14th century um, decree from Egypt. Uh, the Mamluk uh, sultans are the ones who issued this one, reused by El Makrizi, the historian that I mentioned earlier. So El Makrizi himself, was not only aware of the practice of um, recycling decrees, he himself actually did it. Um, Makrizi also mentions a scenario where there was an attempted coup on the palace in Cairo during the Mamluk period, I think 1388 is the date that he's discussing, during which the archives were, how shall we say, liberated um, and uh, sold off, he says, by weight on the market as 
uh, scrap paper. So we know that there were sales of scrap paper, at least in a later period. And I think it's not um, unlikely that those kinds of sales of scrap paper were also happening um, during the Fatimid period, although I have found no um, really like smoking guns, but there is sufficient circumstantial um, evidence that the practice was also an earlier one. It's also a practice, this recycling of decrees that transcends the Islamic world. So this was brought to my attention by Susan Whitfield, um, formerly of the British Library, director of the International Dunhuang Project. Um, at Dunhuang in Western China, where there was a kind of Geniza-like thing that was found right around the same time, around 1900. Um, you have the decree of one of the rulers of Dunhuang from the 10th century, giving an official permission to um, an official to send his daughter to a monastery, a Buddhist monastery. Um, and this is reused on the uh, verso for a dharani, which is a kind of liturgical text um, in use among Buddhists. And fascinatingly, one of the most common reuses you have of the Fatimid decrees is liturgical as well. So when you, um, when you saw a decree uh, like this, you were meant to be impressed. But this was not the only format that decrees came in. Um, and in fact, it wasn't the preferred format for archiving decrees if you were working in the Fatimid Chancery or anywhere in the central administration. If you were an administrator, um, you would do something much more sensible. You would take something more compact. This is 25 centimeters across. So um, I've, I've expanded it on the slide so that you can see it a bit closer up, but just to compare it to this one, sorry, I gave away the punchline. To compare it to this one, this is 23 centimeters, sorry, 21 and a half centimeters um, uh, across, whereas um, this one is 25 centimeters wide. So it is absolutely tiny compared to um, the grand rotally which is as it should be, because if you're going to be archiving something, then space is at a premium and you wanna archive in um, as compact a way as you can. So this is a copy of a Fatimid decree. Um, this time it's dated 1134, which is excellent for us. These things are rarely um, fully dated and often the date has been torn away. Um, and it's been folded in half to form a bifolio. This bifolio, unlike some of the other ones that I've shown you was not meant to be part of um, a choir or a codex. A bifolio was a kind of standard um, archival format. And the way you would bind these things together in the archive was by punching them through um, with some kind of like a needle or a long nail. And in fact, you can see that each of these pages has a hole um, in the middle. Um, blue is the background that's uh, used standardly at Cambridge when you photograph manuscripts. So that's the Cambridge blue um, back there, but, but these, are, these are holes um, right in the middle of the page. And that was a binding method um, for the archives. So it was Jeffrey Kahn who found this archival um, version of a Fatimid decree um, among the Geniza documents. And that was kind of, um, for me, that's what cracked open the case that, so, what are these long, beautiful things for? They're to impress people. They're certainly not for preservation or archiving, which raises the question, once you're finished reading the decree aloud or you as a lower official in, uh, in uh, Jerusalem receiving this decree from a higher official or from the central chancery in Cairo, once you've acted on its orders, what do you do with it? You're under no obligation to archive it because that's being done in the chancery in Cairo itself. Um, so you can simply discard the paper. We're in a world of the handmade where people aren't simply throwing things away. Generally, things get reused until they can't be reused anymore. So, uh, you know, any, any smart official um, would try to make some money on the side and, uh, and use some of these perhaps um, uh, to, to do that, um, selling them to use paper sellers from which um, or from whom anybody could, could buy them and reuse them. So in the book, this was maybe one of the crazier things that I did in the book, but I uh, compared um, these uh, rotally to the instruments of performance um, of, for instance, the who, right? Which is that once the performance has finished, the instruments will be destroyed, right? And that's kind of um, way of even heightening the, the excitement 
um, of the performance. They weren't necessarily destroyed in front of people the way the way the Who's instruments were, um, but the idea is the same that they're ephemeral um, instruments of performance. Um, I think in the interest of time, well, let me just very briefly tell you what's on the slide, but I won't go through it in, in any um, detail. Um, towards the end of writing this book, so I turned in the manuscript in late 2018, um, I uh, came into contact with a um, former PhD student from Princeton, uh, Anna Dolganov, who um, is now at the University of Vienna, absolutely fantastic Roman historian and a papyrologist who was working on very similar questions to mine, but um, a thousand years earlier, um, but also in Egypt. And she uh, discovered that Romans were, uh, had very different strategies of archiving from the Fatimids. Um, and the strategies that the Romans used is that they wanted everything preserved in triplicate. They wanted preserved in the central archives, in the regional archives, in the local archives, and they wanted it all to match. And they um, basically have very high standards for, for record keeping, um, which sometimes backfired on them. So um, Dolganov found um, a papyrus originally from Teptunis in Middle Egypt um, that contains um, the complaints of uh, archivists um, from the Arsinoite gnome. Um, saying we ourselves were appointed a very long time ago and had received from the previous keepers documents, keepers of the archives, documents that for the most part lacked their beginning and some of which were generally damaged or stuck together while successive stratagoy and local scribes, royal scribes delivered to us their accounts in whatever state they were and due to the great quantity of the world's roles, they lie unsorted in heaps. So translation, when we got our job, we had we found these piles lying around the archives being like nibbled at by mice um, on the floor. It's not our fault. It's the fault of the people before us. But now there's too much for us to fix ourselves. So can you please send us some help? So this kind of backlog of archiving is something that you would not find um, among Fatimid archivists. Fatimid archivists had the opposite approach. They did not want to preserve things in triplicate. They were very, very lean. They pruned the archives often, and they only archived exactly what they had to, and generally speaking, only in the central archives in Cairo. Um, and we know this from some, uh, some secondary descriptions um, from people like El Mokrizi about how the, the Fatimids handled their archiving, but also from the material remains of Fatimid um, archival texts themselves. Ultimately, I tried to argue in this book that the story isn't just about the Fatimids. It's also about the Abbasids, and it's also, it has implications for studying pre-modern states in general. Um, the Abbasids, the relationship between the Fatimids and the Abbasids fascinates me because on the one hand, they hated each other and were enemies and the Fatimids um, wanted to reduce the size of the Abbasid Caliphate to the point where they even almost invaded Baghdad itself um, and uh, the Fatimids were Shiites and the Baghdad, the, the Abbasids were Sunnis, um, which, you know, wasn't the only issue that divided them, but was certainly part of it. Um, and, uh, and since there could only be one legitimate caliph, um, there was no kind of, you know, mutual recognition uh, treaty between these two empires. On the other hand, there is evidence of um, a very surprising kind of continuity in um, government administration techniques um, from the Abbasids over to the Fatimids. And this um, was, was really fascinating to me. So there, there are three things that I track in my book um, that move from East to West. One of them is paper. Um, the second is, um, sorry, I just have some kind of a glitch in my notes here. Uh, yes, one of them is paper. Um, one of them is Arabic calligraphy styles. Those also move from east to west. Um, and the third is specific wording or ways of expressing imperial power through state documents. So I'll just give you a, um, a kind of glimpse of each of these things um, and, uh, and then draw some conclusions. Um, this is an Umayyad decree. The Umayyads ruled from 661 to 750. Their capital was in Damascus. So this is quite early as Arabic documents go. 
Um, and it's written on papyrus. So papyrus was a writing material that was available in abundance in Egypt. It had been used literally for millennia as the main portable writing surface among Egyptians. There were attempts to grow papyrus um, on the banks of the Tigris and also in Sicily, um, nothing terribly long lived. So really, you know, Egypt was kind of still the main um, producer um, in this period. Um, this is a papyrus document that survives from Iraq. Um, so one of the very, very rare medieval Arabic documents that survive um, from Iraq. This one was excavated at Samarra, which was an Abbasid palace in use in the ninth century. Um, and I'll get back to the significance of this in a minute, but for now, I just wanted to show you an example of papyrus used outside of Egypt. Um, paper is um, a, a fascinating technology that ended up totally revolutionizing um, many aspects of um, Islamic culture. Um, paper making technology originated in China, but um, it had been, use, been in use in Central Asia for many, many centuries when the Muslims um, got there in the early eighth century. So paper was like a totally normal um, writing surface in, uh, in late antique Central Asia. Um, Parchment was also used as well as tanned leather, um, but, uh, but, but paper was quite common. Um, so when the Umayyads um, first got to Central Asia in the 720s, they had their first encounter with paper and immediately started using it. The first Arabic documents that we have on paper are from Central Asia and they date from the 720s. Um, this is uh, the earliest um, dated, um, securely dated, um, Arabic codex on paper, um, and uh, it's from, actually that's not true, sorry, there's another, there's an earlier one from the ninth century, I'll get, I'll get back to what this is the earliest example of. In any case, this is a very early um, Abbasid uh, manuscript on paper from the middle of the 10th century, um, copied in Baghdad, now in Istanbul. Um, and then we have the Fatimid use of paper. By the time the Fatimids arrive in Egypt in 969, paper had been through um, uh, many decades of being the kind of imperial writing surface of choice. The Abbasids heavily relied on paper for their day-to-day -day administration so that by the time um, Egyptians uh, had access to paper starting in the 10th century, it already had the prestige of the Abbasid government attached to it. What's remarkable about the story of paper in Egypt is that although papyrus had been used for millennia, um, it had a very, very brief period of um, complete uh, uh, obsolescence, by which I mean, sorry, that was badly phrased. Between 900 and 940, papyrus goes from being the writing surface of choice in Egypt to being totally obsolete. Um, so between 900 and 940, paper takes over as the portable um, writing surface of choice among Egyptians, despite the dominance of papyrus for many uh, millennia beforehand. And part of that, um, that very rapid um, uh, uh, obsolescence um, is the fact that paper came with governmental prestige attached to it because the Abbasids had relied on it for so long. So that's paper. Calligraphy also moves from east to west. Um, that same Umayyad papyrus decree that I showed you, you can also see that it's very grand. There's wide line spacing and there's also wide space between the letters, but this is a completely different kind of script. Um, we refer to it as Kufic script. It doesn't necessarily have to do with the city of Kufa, but that's what it's called. Um, and it's a very orthogonal script. So um, lots of horizontals, lots of verticals and lots of sharp angles. Um, eventually uh, Kufic script gets replaced by uh, curvilinear script. Um, the Iraqi papyrus that I showed you has a kind of early example of curvilinear script, um, which ultimately um, over just a few decades would turn into something like this. This is in fact the, um, the earliest securely dated um, example of uh, curvilinear proportioned script um, that we have. And it dates from 959, 10 years before the Fatimid conquest of Egypt and the Fatimids exclusively used um, curvilinear proportion script to write their government documents on paper, not on stone. They used other things for stone, but for paper, um, they used proportioned uh, curvilinear script. Um, and then the, the last thing that moves from east to west in my book um, are the specific ways of um, 
of writing government documents in order to express the prestige um, of government. And fascinatingly, the, the wording of these decrees turns out to, in some sense, be um, the most fungible. So formularies change very quickly, wording can change um, very quickly over time, but it's the kind of substrates um, of, of how to write these government documents that change more slowly. Um, and for me, that's fascinating. I love that complexity that you're up against anytime you encounter two historical rivals, um, in this case, the Abbasids and the Fatimids, but you can probably think of many other examples who are in fact quite similar, even though they think they're totally different. So what Harold Bloom called the anxiety of influence um, means it's never just a polarized relationship. There will always be similarities. And as a historian, it's absolutely fascinating to unravel those. So a um, couple of um, final words. Um, what was I thinking when I started this project? Well, I thought I was writing a book on um, Fatimid petitions, on the petition and, and response procedure um, among the Fatimid caliphs who would hear petitions on any subject, didn't matter how um, minor or personal it was, they um, encouraged their subjects to petition. Um, and I thought that the Lost Archive was an introduction to the petitions book. And when I got to, I don't know, maybe like 100,000 words, I realized this is no longer the introduction to a book. This is a book of its own. Um, I thought petitions were the most abundantly, when I started, the most abundantly preserved type of Fatima document and the most important type for understanding the interface between the state and its subjects. Um, that turned out not to be true. Um, I thought that petitions were abundant because previous scholars had worked um, disproportionately on Fatimid petitions because they're very charismatic documents. They have these little stories and they're kind of fun to unravel. Um, but I also thought that petitions were the most important interface between the state and its subjects because previous scholarship had talked about the Fatimids as having ruled um, by petition and decree that there was this kind of um, passivity attributed to the Fatimids where they only issued a decree when somebody would petition them. That turned out not to be true. There were many, many, many Fatimid decrees um, that were issued without any petition to provoke them. And in fact, most of the decrees that I found from the Geniza were issued to lower officials from higher officials, managing infrastructure, canals, um, taxes, crops, um, all kinds of um, things that you do in the normal course of governance. Um, what I, uh, and also of course tax receipts were probably much, much produced in much greater number um, than, than petitions were. So what I ended up with was a more realistic sense of how a medieval Middle Eastern state governed. There was a complex bureauc bureaucracy and the complexity lay not just in numbers, but also in the complexity of procedures. Um, it was also a principled government. Um, the Fatimids um, actually had explicit, explicit statements to the effect of, if we're going to be asking people for tax money and we don't want them to rebel or like totally hate our guts, then we have to give them something in exchange. And that's something that we wanna give them is justice. So in other words, the petitions were abundant. They weren't the most abundant thing, but they were important in the Fatimid worldview because that had to do with the ethics of rule. And that in turn um, made me realize that the field had perhaps unconsciously internalized a vision of um, certain medieval Middle Eastern states that made them out to be simultaneously more and less powerful than they really were. So the previous vision of the Fatimids had overstated their power because um, the assumption was that the Fatimids, like many pre-modern emp empires, must have been um, autocratic. But in fact, for any pre-modern state, there were real limits on, autoc on autocracy because of practical constraints, communications, um, uh, demographic constraints, right? The total population of the planet Earth in the year 1100 was something like 300 million. So people are spread out very thinly compared to um, what we're used to. Um, uh, and also legitimacy concerns. Um, there is a limit to how much you can sit on your subjects to um, extract um, resources from them um, without provoking um, rebellion. Um, and then there's also this ethics of rule that I talked about. And previous visions of the Vatimids had 
I mean, not just overstated their power, but also understated their power or even elided it because they were focused on the central administration and less on the complexities of the provincial administration without which the central administration could not have done its job. So that um, is my book in a nutshell and uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. That was quite fascinating and I, I learned a lot. Um, so I do have a couple of kind of comments and questions. One of them wants to kind of go back to the significance of the cover, if it's possible to talk about that again, uh, just to refresh our minds. Sorry, the significance of? Of the cover, of the book cover. Oh, yes, of the book cover. So um, I found, um, I mean, I was kind of blown away um, by finding one of these um, decrees represented in an actual painting. Um, but was what was even kind of more fun about it is um, those aren't government officials that are holding these decrees, they're angels. Um, this has to do with a Quranic verse um, that talks about the day of judgment um, when the good and bad deeds of man will be tallied up. So mm -hmm. the angel on the right is tallying up the good deeds and on the left is tallying up the bad deeds. Um, but interestingly, that kind of counting of good and bad deeds um, is, is reimagined by the artist as um, almost a bureaucratic procedure, right? Mm -hmm. And then the decree gets issued. So there are these angels with these with these decrees, and they're they're kind of meant to be recognized as such, right? That's sort of the you know the visual um, joke that's that's being made. I mean, maybe not a joke, mm -hmm. but it's it's a it's certainly a comment. Um, there, I found one other really interesting set of um, of illustrations from an early 14th century manuscript that had. Um, a chancery scribe seated to um, the left-hand side of, um, of a ruler, actually a pre-Islamic ruler in this case, but depicted in the Islamic style from the 14th century. Um, and fascinatingly, not only is the chancery scribe writing on one of these rotally, but they're also copying from um, an archival uh, decree with two holes in the middle and a string strung through. So this was like you know, that was when the penny dropped about the whole kind of archiving system because people were aware of it and illustrated it in, in manuscripts. Mm, thank you. Um, there's another question about the Caliph Moaz is believed to have a massive library. Uh, would you have any comments about that or? So the Fatimid library is really, um, a lot of ink has been spilled on this question. And um, part of it is that you will read in Fatimid Chronicles about the Khizanat um, al-Kutub, the, the treasury, right, the imperial treasury of books. Um, and part of it as well has to do with the way the Ayyubid takeover of the Fatimid Caliphate um, has been depicted in the historiography, both medieval and modern historiography. So there's one chronicler who says that when Saladin abolished the Fatimid Caliphate and declared loyalty once again to the Abbasids, um, he threw 1,600,000 volumes into the Nile until it ran black with ink, right? So um, my, my colleague, Conrad Hirschler, who uh, used to teach at your esteemed institution, um, was the first person who pointed out to me that whenever you see multiples of four and seven in the Chronicles, you have to ask yourself whether these numbers are real or not, because mm -hmm. they love multiples of four and seven. Um, so what does that mean for the real Fatimid library? Well, we certainly have many um, texts from the Fatimids, but the vast majority are in later copies, um, mm. copies made especially in Yemen um, and in mm. Gujarat. Mm. Thank you. There's, a, there's an interesting quest question by Muzna. Um, first of all, thank you for the talk. Loads of the questions begin with saying fascinating, riveting talk, etc. Um, does this combo of Arabic within Hebrew text show the unity once lived in it, or is simply due to the scarcity of writing material? Uh, have you looked into that, like kind of the social uh, context of uh, coexistence, perhaps? Or absolutely. Um, so coexistence, in the in the sense in which we would um, imagine it today, right? In other words, um, for us, the idea that uh, you know, 
the vast majority of Jews lived in the Islamic world until something like 1200, 1300 um, is, is maybe you know, paradoxical to us today because of 20th century politics. Um, but in fact, at the time, there was absolutely nothing unusual about it. So um, the people I study from the Geniza, the Jewish traders, the Jewish communal servants, um, you know, even like the nameless. I mean, nobody would have thought of this as coexistence. That for them, it was just like completely normal. So Jews um, spoke Arabic, wrote Arabic. Um, I mean, did it for Persian. Um, they wrote it in Hebrew characters, but some didn't. Some um, switched back and forth between Hebrew and Arabic characters. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, this is like, you know, normal. Um, that said, it's an interesting question of when, uh, uh, like your average everyday person is looking at one of these recycled decrees, do they know what they're looking at? So this is a question that I had a lot of fun thinking about because um, a colleague of mine, Oded Zinger, who is now teaching at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, um, brought to my attention a Geniza document that I knew about, but I had never really thought about it in this context. It's um, a record of a court case in which um, it's so great that the, like, the testimony is a little story. And the story is um, we were walking past the market in um, Saifain, which is a particular area in Cairo. And, um, and we passed our friend, uh, the guy's name is Nahum, and he was laughing his head off and we didn't know why. So we turned to him, we said, Nahum, why are you laughing your head off? And he was holding a piece of paper and the piece of paper was a decree um, that said that he was allowed to um, leave this, the congregation that he belonged to and go and found his own congregation. So basically he had petitioned the caliph and said, hey, I wanna found my own congregation, can I do that? And the chancellor was like, sure, why not? Like, we don't care what you do, that's fine. Um, he'd gone above the head of his rabbi, basically, <laughs> to say, I'm gonna defect. Um, and in the testimony, the, the guys who pass him all they had to do was take one look at this decree and they knew what they were looking at, right? right. So the more I thought about that, the more I thought, okay, this is like, uh, you know, something that isn't just restricted to, mm -hmm. to government offices, but something that people actually knew about. And in relation to the, the decrees, uh, you, you know, when you mentioned that the papers were sometimes recycled, was it just the actual paper or the contents, like example, the decrees, were they also endorsed or... Do you know what happened to them with that? That's an excellent question. Um, so in fact, um, there are many types of document in Hebrew script, so Jewish documents that very clearly are imitating um, Fatimid chancery style. And this happens at different levels depending on the kind of document. But um, the the clearest examples are the decrees and the petitions um there are documents in hebrew um issued by high-ranking jewish communal authorities so the head of the jewish community in um in fustat or um you know other kind of like important central figures in the community when they issue pronouncements starting in the 1060s they begin to issue them um, with very, very wide line spacing, mm -hmm. and also with a kind of upward curvature of the lines, just like you have in the Fatima decrees. And it's so striking um, I, that I wrote a whole article about it um, that I published in 2014. But interestingly, um, the Jewish iteration of this kind of wide line spacing decree style did not begin um, under the Fatimids. It began in Baghdad. So in mm -hmm. fact, it was Iraqi Jews who brought this kind of wide line spacing style um, over to the Fatimid realm and started to use it as a way of kind of expressing more power in, um, you know, this is a more impressive looking decree and thus I'm a more impressive looking um, person if, uh, if I issue it. With the petitions, it's even, it's even more fascinating because the petitions actually have the very wording of Fatimid petitions preserved in Judeo-Arabic. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, because it's formulaic, we can actually reconstruct um, holes in the Arabic uh, Fatimid petitions based on what we find in the Judeo-Arabic and, and vice versa. So it's very much kind of one universe of, of formulary that's getting passed back and forth. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, other questions related to whether the, 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 the text in Arabic was erased. One question says that the areas where Arabic text is written within the Hebrew lines has sort of been erased. Is that correct? And whether you have any info on that or 
kind of your opinion? So of the um, hundreds, maybe, you know, more than a thousand of these things that I've um, looked at, I've only found one example where somebody tried to erase the Arabic text and they very quickly gave up because they realized they were destroying the paper. Um, so parchment um, is often erased in the Middle Ages, first of all, because parchment is expensive, but also because you can scrape or, um, or rub the ink off of the surface of parchment and reuse it that way. That's what a palimpsest is, right? So the, the Greek word um, that gives us palimpsest means um, to scrape anew. So basically you're scraping ink off of the page to reuse it. You can't do that with paper. Um, I mean, you can, but you end up with like very weak yeah, um, paper with holes in it. Yeah. Um, so that's why they end up writing around um, the lines as opposed to, um, or between the lines as opposed to actually um, erasing erasing mm -hmm. the lines. Um, I wanted to say one other thing um, about paper versus versus parchment. Um, yes. Parchment's very very expensive, so you have the, the motivation to reuse it. So the question is, if paper is inexpensive, then why are people reusing it? Was there a shortage? So um, I uh, started to ask myself this question at some point, and I, I started researching paper prices. Um, and like one big caveat is that um, it's very, very difficult to research prices um, from documentary sources um, mm. because the units of measure are not always standard. Um, mm. Often they're vague. Like they'll talk about a dust of paper, which is like a ream, but it doesn't actually have a fixed number the way our modern ream does. Um, and there are all kinds of other like, you know, measures. Then there's quality of paper. They talk about, you know, Syrian paper, Egyptian paper, um, you know, paper named after this government official, paper named after that government official. But, and we have so much paper in the Geniza, but we can't correlate the names of these paper qualities with the actual paper that we're looking at. Um, so, so that was one, one challenge, but once I kind of decided, okay, I'm just going to go with some vague, like impressionistic numbers. What I discovered is that the only time people in the Geniza world actually write about a paper shortage is if they're traders writing from India. So mm -hmm. India was a place where it was difficult to get your hands on paper. And in fact, we do have some Geniza documents from India written on cloth. Um, and, uh, you know, basically like, uh, anything you can find, um, but for the rest, I have found no evidence that there was ever a shortage of paper um, in Egypt or Syria. I think it wasn't cheap, but it wasn't prohibitively expensive mm. either. So why reuse? So that's why I said the thing that I, that I mentioned earlier about like these are pre-modern cultures where everything is handmade. So you wouldn't even dream of throwing something away, right? We're, we're really the only people who have this concept of like, you know, garbage and, and the fund fungibility of, uh, of objects because we live in a post-plastic, post-container shipping um, mm -hmm. world. But back then you would reuse things in, in myriad ways. Um, mm -hmm. So they were basically dust. Mm. And do you have any comments on, on, uh, on the dispersal of, supposed dispersal of many Fatimite te texts by the Ayyubids? Uh, when they came to power, did they burn or throw the materials or just toss them away? Or did they preserve oh. them somewhere? The question. That is, that, yeah, that's a, that's a very big and very important question. Um, the, the Fatimid archives, um, where did they go? What, what happened to them? That is a question ultimately that I was unable to answer. Um, but at the same time, it becomes a little bit easier to answer once you um, kind of divide the question into smaller chunks. So mm -hmm. one very like interesting little rabbit hole that I went down that turned into chapters 11, 12, and 13 in the book um, was what happened to the um, Fatimid official manuals that were kind of kept around um, the bureaus of government as like guides to, you know, how do you actually do a cadastral survey in the Delta, that kind of thing. Um, and those fascinatingly um, had remarkable longevity. So there was a particular um, Fatimid guide to taxation um, that gets uh, copied and, sorry, it's actually written in the Ayyubid period, but it's written by an official trained under the Fatimids. Um, we don't actually have a Fatimid one that, that survives over that period, but we do have officials who are trained under the Fatimids who continue to work under the Ayyubids, practicing what we assume are similar methods to what they would have done under the Fatimids. Um, so one of these uh, early Ayyubid um, taxation manuals is copied continuously until the Ottoman period, basically until the 19th century. That's like the latest manuscript we have of it. 
because on very, very technical subjects, um, you would have been motivated to keep the instruction manual, you know, around as long as you could. But as far as these day to day government administrative documents go, um, we have many, many later copies in Mamluk era chronicles in uh, Ayyubid era chronicles. Um, but, uh, but as far as the originals go, um, the, the two places, the only, well, it's like three places you can find them are the Monastery of St. Catherine in Sinai, the Cairo Geniza, and then another one of the synagogues um, in Cairo, which has now been incorporated into the Jewish community archives. It was the Karaite synagogue, or one of the two Karaite synagogues, oh. where they preserved an intact Fatima mm -hmm. decree um, from 10, uh, 1034. And so in relation to the documents, uh, there's a question whether that, uh, other than uh, chancery or legal records, were there any liturgical or historical texts uh, found in the Geniza uh, archives? In Arabic script or in Hebrew script? It doesn't say, but uh, I, I, I would think it's the uh, Hebrew script. The question does not- So yes. Um, well, I mean, I can answer both. So with the, with the Hebrew script, um, the vast majority of what is, I mean, let's, I don't wanna say the majority, but plurality. So about a quarter of what we have actually cataloged from the Geniza, what we know about um, is liturgical. So it seems to have been the people who were leading services in this synagogue who had the most acute need for scrap paper. So they're the big recyclers. Um, and part of that is that they were expected to come up with new liturgical poems like, you know, all the time. So they were constantly like rummaging around for, for, for used paper. Um, as far as the Arabic script texts go, this is really um, an area of research that, um, that needs more people. There are an enormous number of Arabic script texts from the Geniza. Um, I found many, many more in the course of this project than I could make use of. Um, they're now being input into the Princeton Geniza Project database, which I run and I have a fantastic team working with me. Um, and one of the things that we're doing right now is inputting all of those Arabic script texts, which include Qadi court documents, a fantastic source for history, Mm -hmm. um, and as well as, you know, medical texts, alchemical texts, scientific texts, um, and, uh, and government documents of many different, um, varieties. And then, you know, philosophy, I mean, all the kinds of genres that were common in this period, um, Jews were reading them and they were in many cases reading them in Arabic script. So just to give you an, an example, and this is actually something I have an image of in the book, um, we can actually, um, trace, um, in, in part, the transmission of the Rasat le Juana Safa, the Letters of the Brethren of Purity, this amazing 10th century Iraqi encyclopedic um, text written collectively by a group who, you know, until recently had never been identified, um, but certainly written in Iraq and Basra um, and Baghdad. Uh, the reception of that text in Egypt can be traced via um, scraps. Um, of copies, like fragments of copies that were found in the Cairo Geniza. So there is a late 10th century um, copy in an Iraqi hand um, of the Rasat Ikhwana Safa that I put an image of in the book because it was found in the Cairo Geniza. So it's a, it's a wonderful kind of unsung source for people who, um, who want more Arabic sources to work on. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, there's a question about, you know, when you were talking about the Hebrew script scribes, uh, you talked about the Hebrew script coming at right angles to the Arabic script and the Arabic being vertical. Was that just part of the description of the picture that you showed or was it a practice at the time? What, what, are you able to comment on that? Sure. There, there's no um, kind of uh, pattern that you can really discern. Um, the Hebrew script scribes will uh, write between the lines in any way that they possibly can. Um, and it all depends on, on what they're writing. Um, so with letters, um, often they're writing parallel to the Arabic lines um, with uh, more ephemeral sorts of texts like notes they will often write perpendicular, but I wouldn't like, you know, I wouldn't go to print with that um, without running the statistic first. Sure. Um, there's a question about whether there were any clues in the documents about why Ismaili theology and ideology was not spread amongst the people of Egypt. Uh, because at that time, uh, Ismaili, according to the question, uh, Ismaili Dawa activity was mostly abroad. Um, any inferential clues, perhaps from the material or 
you'd rather not answer that. I don't know. So I have nothing direct on that, um, but I will say, and this is kind of really in the realm of the circumstantial, but it might help help for, for some context, um, that you really get the sense from the texts that were produced by the by government officials for the government, as opposed to whatever they're writing in their spare time, which could have been, you know, theology or, or anything you can imagine, um, that these were two separate realms. Mm -hmm. um, that that Fatima ideology was one thing, and the day-to-day -day business of administration was another thing. Mm -hmm. um, and the ideology wasn't like, you know, the, the first thing in any official's mind when they were collecting um, taxes, except to the extent mm -hmm that somebody like al qadi and Noaman, the architect of Fatimid law, um, had said in the 10th century, if the people you're collecting taxes from need um, a delay, um, you know, need a kind of extension um, into the next year, please give it to them because ultimately, you know, we're about mercy. We're about justice and mercy and we're not about oppression. That's as far as it goes on, on the level of, of practicality. Um, but that's, you know, that's really one of the big um, issues in Fatimid studies today is that um, there are very few people, I mean, Paul Walker is one of the great exceptions, but there are very few people who study both um, Fatimid philosophy slash theology on the one hand and Fatimid politics and administration on the other, because it's kind of hard to find those, those meeting points. I, like I have, a, I have this one official I'm working on who I know is doing both. Like he's a government administrator on the one hand um, and he's a Mu'tazili philosopher on the other, but I can't, you know, it's like, oh, five o'clock time to do the other job. Like, it seems like there's no, you know, there's, yeah. there's really no mixing between yeah. these two sides of, uh, of his activity. There's, there's a question that is particular to whether uh, the Geniza documents tell us anything about the state of and relations between Karate and rab rab uh, rabbinical Jews in the Fatimid Empire. Uh, did you look into that at all? Or? I'm so glad you asked. I wrote a whole book on that. So th this is actually interesting. So my, my first book, which I published in 2008, um, Heresy and the Politics of Community, was on exactly this question, which is, Karaites and Rabbinites, the two main um, movements or schools of Judaism in this period, um, and Karaites and Rabbinites were both, you know, substantial um, communities in, in Egypt. Um, they, what we had until people looked into Geniza documents was just the polemics between them. So you really get the sense that, you know, they hate each other's guts and they can't be found in the same room together. Um, but in fact, Geniza documents, there had been some published in the 50s and some more in the 90s. Um, and then I started to dig into it more um, that suggested that not only did they get along um, when they needed to or in certain contexts, but also they married each other. So mm -hmm. we have examples of carrots and marrieds and Rabbinites marrying each other and deciding and writing into their marriage contracts what their religious observance is gonna look like and how they're gonna, um, you know, kind of, they, they basically pre-negotiate um, all of the significant um, practical differences between the way they observe um, mm. Jewish law. Um, so that, you know, experience of kind of like, let's see what happens when you throw the Geniza at this problem and realizing that the polemics are just one aspect of a much, much, more complex um, social picture. I would say that unconsciously, that's kind of what like uh, led to this interest that I was talking to you about before um, of in, in how the Abbasids and the Fatimids were actually quite similar, right? And, mm -hmm. um, and would borrow from each other um, as opposed to just polemicizing against each other. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Um... Marcus, do you have any question coming in? Because I think I've I, asked. Yeah, there is one that actually, um, Dr. Arash Zaini, I was thinking that if we're not mistaken, did you mention the script, you know, going from East to West? What was it? Could you elaborate on that, the Arabic calligraphy at this period, you know, going from East yes. to West? Can you just maybe perhaps um, touch upon that? Absolutely. Thank you for, for the question. Um, so here I'm building on another body of work by Jeffrey Kahn, who um, is like an amazing scholar in many, many um, different subfields of, of Semitic language studies. And he, he did a number of studies on um, a kind of notable um, change that happened in the script that you find on Arabic papyri from Egypt in the ninth century. And he calls this the Pahlavi substrate. Um, so why does he do that? Because 
It turns out that there were an enormous number of bilingual administrators, Pahlavi or Persian and Arabic, um, who uh, first of all were working for the Abbasids in Khorasan in the eighth century. And um, we know this because small archives have been uh, excavated um, that uh, have some documents in Pahlavi and some documents in, um, in Arabic. And if you look at the Arabic and you don't know that it's Arabic, you really don't know what it is. And you're like, is that Pahlavi? Pal and then yeah. Jeffrey Kahn comes along and is the only human on the face of the planet who yeah. can actually um, <laughs> decide for them. So he matched that script up with the change that you have in Egyptian papyri in the ninth century and realized that the chroniclers also talk about all of these bilingual administrators coming from Khorasan into Egypt and bringing their scribal styles with them. I mean, you yeah. can see it in the documentation. So that was what got me thinking, Okay, so we can see this uh, Pahlavi substrate, right, coming from Khorasan to Egypt in the ninth century. We see paper coming from Khorasan to Egypt in the 10th century. What else are we going to find? So that was when I started looking at the development of Arabic calligraphy um, in the, the 10th and 11th centuries. And this was like so fascinating to me because um, I really wasn't expecting to go in this direction. No. Um, but it turns out that the Abbasid chancery scribes had a lot were, of uh, Persians, a lot of Iranians working there. I think. A lot of whom were Iranians. And all of this is happening under the Buyids also, yeah. um, which is like important to, to remember, um, are uh, very concerned with um, classical proportioning in script. And it actually has, it's the same circle as the Ikhwana Safa, who write also a lot about um, geometric proportioning. This here I'm building um, on the work of Anna George at Oxford. Um, and, uh, and so if you kind of, you know, we don't have a lot of physical evidence of Abbasid chancery styles from the 10th century, but there is that one document I showed you and there's some like writing about Abbasid chancery styles and to the extent that we can reconstruct them, the best evidence that we have of what an Abbasid document would have looked like in the 10th century is what a Fatima document looked like in the 11th century. Yeah. So that's Hence that, the, that yeah. westward movement. That's right. And it's interesting, a couple of the scraps that you showed, I really thought there was almost Pahlavi letters in there. I mean, you know, just a snapshot was um, there. And I think, am I right that maybe in Balkh, you know, Dr. Arzu Azad, is she, has she got this thing, this project? I mean, she, is probably finding similar things, but around Balkh and around, um, you know, it's, it's extraordinary, this uh, level. I thought also some of the, I mean, I, I find the Arabic script of that period that you're showing, you know, some of the Qurans, for example, we see are totally ineligible. But I thought some of the material you showed, I mean, even I, as a Persian, I thought I can read this, I can work it. I mean, it's very, clear very non 10th century you know it's extraordinary um, the clarity is a big um a big point that um the people who talk about arabic calligraphy in the 10th century talk about they're like you know they're really uh focused on clarity but i have to warn you it's deceptive so i also yeah. when i when i first started looking at these yeah. decrees i was like oh it's so clear and then you realize like they're not always writing with dots and they do this thing called, um, that the field has come to call abusive ligatures, where you connect letters that aren't supposed to be connected. And it can be very challenging. And that's kind of actually the beauty of them is that they seem so clear, but they're so kind of like mysterious at the same time. And that's also what makes them totally addictive to, uh, to work on as a historian. And just to say, cause you mentioned Arzu Azad's project, Invisible East, which is a fantastic project to um, bring together many different corpora of documents from the Persianate world um, in the you know eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh century, and exactly in this period, and a bit later as well. I think they go through the thirteenth. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the documents that that her project is working on, I also talk about it in my book because it's kind of like the Eastern manifestation yes. of the Abbasid yeah. Chancery script. So they're very much connected. I wondered whether I thought in your book I ought to check to see whether there is an overlap. Absolutely. And there's, I think, a question if the a scholar you mentioned at Oxford, I think the name that who uh, uh, written about Ikhwan al Safa here wrote about the proportion in calligraphy. Could you kindly repeat the name yes. of the scholar? This is uh, Alain Georges. 
Um, and the book is called, I think, The Rise of Arabic Calligraphy, if I'm not mistaken, I could be getting that wrong, but um, it's a fantastic book where he actually you know, draws the circles and the lines so that you can see the proportioning um, of the script and not just the curvilinear script. He also talks about Kufic script being very, very carefully proportioned. But he was the one who kind of found the link to the Ikhwana Safa that they talk about classical proportioning as really a matter of kind of philosophy. Um, but, and they talk about it with music, they talk about it with, you know, geometry and engineering, and they're very concerned with these kinds of issues of proportioning. And it's the same people who are involved with that circle of the Ikhwana Safa. In some cases, the same exact people are writing, um, either working for the chancery or writing treatises um, on, on how to write uh, beautifully yes. in Arabic. I think maybe some of that is also covered by Professor Stefan Schmerl's book on uh, yes. Arabic script, on uh, what was it, the divine uh -huh. script? Or, I think he has that historical bit about how, you know, it, it was actually a science and the mm. art of writing, yeah. Mm. But the idea of proportional uh, proportionality in calligraphy and how, how it's reflected even in the design and the architecture and the prints uh, is, is, is very interesting. Um, I think we're coming almost I to the. I think so. Yes. The, yeah, I we're coming we to the end of the... Uh, such a brilliant time, Marina. Um, Thank you so much. We had yes. so many people saying amazing talk, um, and we just remind the audience where they can get the book. Hopefully, they will buy it, and uh, we look forward to hosting you again. Absolutely. Thank awesome. you so much. Thank you for the excellent questions, and thanks for the opportunity to talk to you. I appreciate it. Thank you, and uh, Aki will. Uh, share the recording with you just in case you want to look at it before uh, we share it with the audience. Uh, but thanks Perfect. a lot. Have a nice Thank uh, you so day much. And um, see you soon, hopefully. Yeah. Um, you too. Stay guess, safe. Bye -bye. Thank bye -bye. you so much. Such a pleasure having you. Thank you. Bye-bye.